Uh, I'm Bill Payne, and today we're interviewing at the American Legion Post, Lamory Hackett Post 72 in Sorbonne, New York. We're interviewing Lucy Abbott, and also present today are um, Mac McElwraith, who's our technician, and our commander, uh, Alan Grzynski, who's handling the camera. So, good morning, Lucy. Good morning. How are you? Good, good. good. Welcome. Uh, what's your birthday, please? February 25th, 1923. Thank you. And uh, you served in the United States Army? In the Women's Army Corps. Thank you. Now, of course, you weren't drafted. No, no. They had a big recruitment at the Old Armory on Broadway in Kingston. I think it's the Neighborhood Center now. And uh, I was working in a cigar factory and hated it. And I wanted to be a nurse. And the wax was the only thing I could join that would guarantee I would be a medical technician. So that's why I went with wax. And um, when I enlisted, I believe, in March, but didn't go into active duty till April. What years were that? Um, I wrote it all down. Um, enlisted in, in the 30th of March, 1945. Uh, went on active duty um, 18th of April, 45, at Poughkeepsie. I went from Poughkeepsie in. And, um, to Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia. Were you living in Kingston at the time you were in Kingston? In Kingston, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you went to Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia. Mm -hmm. And that was a shock to your system. Part of the living in these barracks with all these women, and somehow we had got acquainted in Poughkeepsie and then in New York with the ones coming from the New York area. but. The biggest shock was the discrimination was still so prevalent in the South. That that just blew my mind, uh, and that continued. When you went in, we went to Chattanooga, Tennessee, quite often. And when we went in town to see these signs, and at the bus stations, blacks only, whites only, it it was just it was a shock to somebody that grew up in Kingston and went to school and best friend was a black girl and yet, you know, it was something so entirely different than we had grown up with. Were there black soldiers in the Women Army Corps? There were some women, black women, yeah. Were they segregated on the base? Um, they kind of had their own units. Now, you went to a boot camp or basic training? Yeah. What was that like? That was different. getting up at, I don't know what time in the morning, and doing some drills and exercises, and then having your area spotless and organized the way they wanted it organized before breakfast, and then come back. And then we did some very, for me, very rigid drills and marching, and, and then we even got into the point of going into a, a gas chamber and putting on gas masks and all, all that. Even though we weren't going overseas, we were trained in that. Do you remember who your instructors were? Not really. What were they like, anyway? There were both kinds. <laughs> Sometimes we felt the men were less hard on us than some of the women. Like the women were out to prove a point that they had attained this rank of captain or something, and they were, you were going to march to their tomb. But that was kind of fun, too. Yeah, you know, we uh, laughed about it that night and got over it, all the aches and pains and sores. <laughs> so you got through it OK? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. How long was it, do you remember? Uh, I think that was only about a month, because we almost right away went into medical training to be technicians. Where did the medical training take place? At Fort Oglethorpe. Also at Fort Oglethorpe. Then, then I was sent to Fort Jackson, South Carolina. There was a base hospital there. And that made me glad I was there, but also made me change my mind. I never wanted to be a nurse again. Um, we got a lot of the young men home from Japan. That they say it wasn't a death march, but that's what they called it, the death march on the time. And those young men were that was sad. And the talking they did and, and things they talked about 
one young fella, we used to set up nights holding him because his he fell and his buddy picked him up to help him and they killed his buddy right then and there because you didn't stop and help anybody. The Japanese were, guards killed his friend? Yeah. And he, he had it too. And then he was a prisoner of war. And it was, uh, he, he was, it, it was just. He'd been held in the Philippines? Yeah, he was held in the Philippines. And uh, it, it was sad. To, and they were nothing, nothing but skin and bones. The, the skin just hang. They were, and you had to be so careful what they ate because they were so hungry and yet they couldn't eat everything right away because they weren't used to it. They had, had nothing in a way, and then to come back. Um, then from there I went to Swannanoa, North Carolina. That was a completely different experience. It was on a mountain. It was a tuberculosis predominantly hospital. Uh, they never had winter. So the year we were there, and then the civilians couldn't come to work up the mountain road. And I said, you mean you don't have salt boxes along the hills? They didn't even know what salt boxes were. And I said, when you go up the PBI hill, if you get stuck, you take a shovel and throw some stuff on the road. And that, that was entirely different. We were there for Christmas Eve. We went to the Catholic Mass. And when we came out, it had snowed, and the trees were frozen and glistened, and it, it was, and we New Yorkers were so happy, and the Southern people were so angry at us, because the next day the civilians couldn't make it up the, the mountain to work, and we had to go back and work double duty, which was kind of all right. Um, you were uh, awarded some uh, medals uh, for your service? Towards the end. Mm -hmm. um, the American Theater, the Victory Ribbon, I don't know what the other one was, there were three. The American Theater, the Victory Ribbon. Good conduct. Yeah, good conduct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then after the war was over, there was a Women's Army Corps medal that was awarded. And I, I have to go down and see them and talk to them about that. Yeah. But, uh, but um, also, there was an experience. Um, then I went from there to, I think, to Augusta, Georgia. And it was more, more general. Is that more general? No, more was, it's one, no, Oliver General. Oliver and the General Hospital, Hospital. yeah. Yeah, in Augusta. But it was by the side of the big golf course where they play all their tournaments now and, and that. Um, that was different. But there was a, that, that was, really different because there was a colored woman in the hospital and had a, she had a child and nobody to take care of it. And we New Yorkers took her child into our barracks and still we were really very severely chastised and that child had to go back and just hang around her mother's room. The hospital was segregated? Mm -hmm. Even yeah. though it was, it was an army hospital? No, she was in the room with other Mm -hmm. But she had a, but we couldn't bring that into our barracks, bring a black child in. It, it wouldn't look well. And they might associate you with black. I, I don't understand their, and I never will, just that the poor youngster, which was maybe three, four years old, had to go and just hang around the mother's bed. No place for a child to go. No, not at that time. There was nothing. And you were able to stay in touch with your family while you were away? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That was... How'd you do that? Telephone and, and, and letters. I had, what, two sisters and a brother and my mother were still... In Kingston? In Kingston, yeah. Yeah, I grew up in Kingston, graduated Kingston High School in 42. Mm -hmm. When you were um, on the different bases and in the hospitals, how was the food? Kind of good. I never complained about it. You had to get used to some of the regional cookings, maybe, and that. But uh, the Christmas that we were in Swannanoa, there were a lot of German prisoners of war on that base, and they worked the kitchen. And Christmas, they had learned enough that they could tell us Merry Christmas. 
as we went through the Chow line. And uh, when they were talking about sending some of them back to Germany, several went out and hung themselves rather than go back to Germany after having been here so long. But uh, they liked our way better. It's amazing. And you had plenty of uh, supplies, you didn't have any shortage of uh, anything? We didn't seem to, no. It seemed like the medical, it was a good outfit to be with, I think, because they had, we never heard about shortages of anything that was needed for the patients. What kind of actual work did you do with the patients? Uh, we could give medication. Mm -hmm. We could even give some shots, it depended. If they were intravenous, we couldn't. Uh, we. Um, wash, change bedding, you know, while they were, helped help them get up and get into chairs and move around. Sometimes we even spoon fed some. There weren't aids at that time like we have in our hospitals today. So that's what we did. I think there was a shortage of nurses even then. And um, did you uh, have any particular things that uh, you used to do for good luck or any uh, things that you did to entertain each other? Not really. We went to the non-commissioned office this hall and played games or watched shows that were being put on for us or things like that. You had live shows that came around? Sometimes, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And uh, then there were select towns we could go to at each, like from Oglethorpe, we could go to Chattanooga because the towns around Oglethorpe was not desirable or something. And Chattanooga was closer. So it made a difference about where the Women's Army Corps members were able to go on leave or on, on liberty? And say. part of it was influenced by the segregation, I think. Uh -huh. that, uh, Did you get to come home at all on furlough? Yeah, this one picture is when I was home. Why don't you hold that up and we'll show that to the camera. Can you get in on that? Uh, this, this one was when I was home visiting a friend's house. Oh, that's looking good. And the one, the other picture, which is uh, just a close-up of you, is oh, that? Oh, that was done while I was in service. That was a post photo? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have a, there was a, I can't remember her name, a woman artist came around and she drew pictures of us, which I have a copy of home. And back behind you here in our museum, we have uh, we have your uniform on yeah, display. Yeah, except for shoes. Except for shoes. We have to get some sensible shoes for the for the. Manager. I think I got a pair I'm wearing out that I'll give you. You can put shoe polish on them; they'll look pretty good. That sounds good. Can you get a sort of a close up of that uh, uniform there somewhat? That's good. Very good. That's the uniform in great condition too. And she has no no hands. We have to get hands. We're going to work on gloves with hands. And that woman went to Albany or something that was doing a lot of that for you. Oh yeah, she did. Yeah, But I see her around, so maybe we're going to see if we can't get uh, get some more work out of her on that. She's very good with it. Did you, um, did you, uh, so did, where were the other places you traveled to? Uh, that was all the places that you were stationed? Uh, I developed rheumatic fever in service and I traveled on a hospital train, which I have a picture of, I should, maybe, they were something to travel on, to um, a Raleigh General in Missouri. That was... O'Reilly General? Raleigh, O'Reilly General in, in Springfield, I think, Missouri. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but then I came back to Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and stayed there and worked. And that's where I was discharged from. You developed rheumatic fever while you were in? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they could, with the testing, they could find no reason or anything to believe it was otherwise. Mm -hmm. So. When you traveled on the on the uh, hospital train, you were moving casualties, were you? From yes. Okay. And uh, or transferring from one hospital to another and and sending them closer home. Basically, they were sent to a hospital that specialized in their problem. And as soon as they could, they moved them to hospitals nearer their homes. Were these uh, casualties mostly from what, the Pacific Theater at that time? Most, most of them were mm -hmm. from 
You know, he seemed to have a, a lot from. What kind of injuries did they have? Um, some had lost arms or legs or, or, or head injuries, but most of them was prisoners of war, and, and it was more starvation that we were trying to treat and, and build them up. Uh, they had been liberated from the Philippines. And brought home. Mm -hmm. yeah. Have we gotten into Japan yet at that stage, or we were still? I think we were, yeah, because yeah. it was almost almost the end when I went in. Okay. I tell my grandkids now, mm -hmm. when I went in, the other countries said, well, if they're taking that Lucy Smith in, in service, we better stop fighting them, <laughs> because right. the war shortly stopped. Obviously it worked. <laughs> Must be scared to, must that's be what scared. I keep telling them. When, when they ask me questions for social studies or something, that's what I keep telling them to yeah. tell the teacher that uh, I really stopped the war. How did, how were you able, how did you treat these uh, fellows who were prisoners of war? What kind of treatment did you give them? Um, did they have, they had, I take it they had different diseases and so forth they contracted over there? Mm -hmm. uh, a big thing that surprised me was this um, tuberculosis or, or and some fungal infections in arms and feet where there had been injuries. Um, I, as I remember, most of the care was just ointments and shots and just a lot of tender, loving care, making them comfortable, trying to keep them. And I will say the, the military tried to bring important family members to see them as soon as they were settled in. and. They were, that was good families medicine. were coming and mm -hmm. that was good medicine that for was them. that was so good and it was good for the parents to see these young boys and that they were back home and you could see a difference between the way we treated the German prisoners of war and the way our prisoners of war were treated. that was so different so different because they 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 almost had freedom yeah you know they ate in the cafeteria after we were served they they didn't go in town by themselves or anything, but they, they were not locked up in cages or anything. They, they just roamed around and... They had a particular uniform they wore, I take it? It was kind of a drab jumpsuit type thing. Mm -hmm. and do you remember any particular humorous, you've already told us some humorous uh, occasions that happened. Can you think of anything else that occurred? You know, another Christmas one was uh, we were by, this was in, goes with the Christmas at Swananoa. Uh, we were near a children's home and uh, we brought the, uh, we did a Christmas party for them in the wax barrack. And that, that was unbelievable uh, to see these youngsters. And we had some, some big heavy woman that worked in the kitchen dressed up as a, a Santa Claus. And they couldn't believe there was a lady Santa Claus. <laughs> and uh, there were gifts for them. We had bought gifts and things like that. You know, it was a, it was a good a good feeling for a holiday to be away from home. I, I mean, it helped get over that, that, well, I'm not home with my family doing what I normally do, but we are doing good. even with the fellas. And everybody got Christmas, even they had to carry it on a tray. They got Christmas dinners and Thanksgiving dinners, whatever the holiday was, an Easter dinner. The patients got, I, I really, I don't know, as not being really a nurse, I felt the patients got excellent, excellent attention and care. What did you, uh, what did your family think of you going into the Women's Army Corps? Well, I don't know, but it was, I just had to do it because I wasn't going to spend the rest of my life in Kingston in Vince like an Orton cigar factory. <laughs> and I had, and I want, thought I wanted to be a nurse. And I went into this and every branch, of, they were recruiting men as, you know, it was a big recruitment. and. Uh, the wax was the only one that would guarantee me medical corps training. Um, but when I came home, I had to go to Vassar Hospital for a testing for my, what I could go to school for. 
and uh, my highest rating was musical. Well, I can't read notes, I can't play an instrument, I can't sing. Uh, so the thought they had was that maybe bookkeeping, accounting, and I went to the old Chris, no, I went first to the business school in Kingston, and I can't remember the name of that one. Chris called it. Chrysler Business. That was in Poughkeepsie. Oh, in Poughkeepsie, yeah. And the one in Kingston closed, and then we finished up over in Chrysler in Poughkeepsie. Okay. And I became a bookkeeper. This is after you came back? After I came back. Yeah. Okay. And so you worked as a bookkeeper then? Mm hmm. Hercules Powder for years. Mm hmm. Sears Roebuck. What was it like on your last day in the service? Do you remember? Kind of sad. Yeah. Yeah. Sad to leave? Sad to leave, and, and you had these friends, and who's going to take care of these patients? I am the greatest, you know, uh, attitude at that time, and yet joy because you were going home. You were going back home. You were going to go back. You were in the service when the war ended. Ended, yeah. The European and the Japanese, right? Do you remember that? Yes. Um, we were in, I believe, Mississippi, yeah. And we were in town when the word came out. And we were all running for churches so we could go say a prayer or, or something. And, and the military came with these big trucks and they were just swooping us all up. We had to get back on base right away. They were afraid of maybe what we would do because it was men and women both from the base in town. And, and you had to go back home uh, to the base. And we kept thinking, what are we gonna do? We're, we're just glad it's over, you know. But they made us all go back to base and there was curfews and for three, four days to make sure. Didn't want you to have too much of a good time. I think they were afraid of just what would, you know, so. Would we drink? Would we fight? Would we? It took a long time for me to accept Japanese people, partly because of what I saw. It took me a long, long time. I know they say forgive and forget, but when you saw the shape of some of those soldiers. And then when you read the story about the women nurses that were captured, it was unbelievable. When you went in, it, was, it wasn't out of the question that you could have been sent overseas. Could have, yes. And you'd heard those stories. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What did you think about that? I, I think I just wanted to get out of Kingston and this was an opportunity and then I could go to school for something when I came back and I, I think that whatever happened, happened. Did your education get supported by the GI Bill? You mentioned yes, it did. Yes, okay, so yeah. when you went to the business schools, you had the GI Bill benefit. Yeah, right, right. right. Okay. Yeah. Now, you developed some friendships in the service, obviously. Did you keep in touch with no, those folks? No. Never did, huh? No. Which is sad. Yeah, no feeling. No reunions? I don't know of any. I have never. When they dedicated the Women's Memorial down in Arlington, Virginia, did you get to go down? No, I didn't. No, Pat did it. No. Yeah, Pat went. Yeah. I would like to go, and I'd like to see the World War II Memorial. And I told my kids, that's where I want to go. I saw it a couple of weeks ago. Did you? Yeah, went there at yeah. night, actually. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Now, uh, the question is, did you join a veterans organization? Tell us about that. Well, I came back to Kingston, and I tried to join the American Legion in Kingston, and they didn't want women, but I could join the auxiliary, which I did for a few years. Then I married and eventually moved to Saugerties. And uh, Jimmy Gage got a hold of me. I don't know how he knew I was in service. I was at the library. How long ago was that? Ten. Ten years or so. Okay. And I joined the Legion at that time. Here. You joined the Legion about ten years ago. Yeah. yeah. And I didn't come to meetings because I didn't know women came to them for a while. And I met Pat Norton through food closets and things like that. And uh, then I started coming. Pat but served in the Pat served in the uh, Waves yeah. the Women's uh, Naval uh, yeah. Bridge. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So she's a member here. And uh, she encouraged me to come out. But now I've reached the stage where I forget it's the third Thursday. It's the third Thursday. Yeah. 
How do you think your military uh, experience influenced you uh, in your life? Well, I think maybe you have developed more compassion, some understanding of different people and cultures. I think that was the biggest thing. Anything else you'd like to add? I don't know. I'm glad I did it. I have never been sorry. And uh, it was a, it was a good experience, good remembrances. Some of it was hard in the beginning, and, and some of the things you saw, and the basic training, to me, who was a couch potato was was rough, but good. I can't believe I was that small. Um, I'm not sorry I did it. I and I would tell anybody else that had thoughts to go ahead and do it. It's it's good, even today. Okay. So, thank, thank you, Lucy Smith Abbott, and. Uh, this is uh, November uh, 28th, 2004, at the uh, American Legion Post in Sorbonne. Thank you very much, Lucy. You are welcome. Now are you going to make a show?